Good. Happy to be back at a convention, right? Yes. <laughs> Well, our first panel this evening is the one and only Mr. David Naughton from American World Hey, yeah, this is great. Oh, and I get to talk on the microphone. This, this, is, this is good. Thanks for coming out. Thank you for coming out. So. So this is, yeah, I'm just, my mind's racing with microphone and a thing. It reminds me of being having to sing Making It back in 1979, with, you know, before they had wireless mics, so you had to like, don't trip on the wire. Okay, never mind. Nope, continue with Making so, It. No, so do you want to uh, ask me questions or do you just want me to we can do start it. by when I was 10? <laughs> <laughs> well, David, I want to ask you first. Um, you have some questions, Summer. I do have questions. Summer gave me a little shout out at the... Uh, on Facebook, I don't know if, if any of you saw it. But I didn't realize we'd be talking on stage, <laughs> but here we are. Yeah, here we are. So, obviously everyone knows American War of London, right? Yeah. Is there anybody that hasn't seen the film? Anybody's not seen it on a big screen? Oh, yeah, hit. that's... <laughs> Me? <laughs> yeah, you're probably, yeah that, that was sort of the way to have seen it. And, and over the years, we, I've done a few shows where we actually would have a screening in a large, you know, venue so that you can actually see it on a big screen. Even with, uh, especially with a Blu-ray on a big screen, it's pretty effective. Mm. Oh, I bet. And you also trained in, in London, right? Yes. How was that? Should we talk about that? Yeah, I would well, love to hear about that. When I was in college, I went to the University of Pennsylvania. I was a BA in English literature and wanted to be, knew I was going to be an actor. There was no drama major at Penn. So I applied to, to drama schools in London and uh, did this audition in New York for a, for a school called Lambda, the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art, which was sort of a misnomer because there's no music, there wasn't any music involved, but it was a you know, professional theater training, training uh, program that was offered to kids you know, internationally. Uh, and, but generally the age was like you know, after high school, which was most of the English kids that I was involved in. Anyway, I, I did this audition in, in New York uh, prepare two pieces, which is the standard thing that actors do, where you do monologues from a play, uh, you know, up tempo or up, you know, a comedic piece and a dramatic piece, and um, and it went okay to where this, this English guy, this gentleman who was the uh, what they call the principal of the school, offered me a uh, the opportunity to come to, in their three-year program, which was not what I really had anticipated. I was getting out of college; I was a senior in college. And going, wait a minute, three years, you know, I'm not going to do three years of a postgraduate kind of idea. I just want to get some training. So, in any case, I went over to London with, you know, literally never been, you know, I've been to, you know, Toronto. I think that was about as far as internationally that I traveled. And went over uh, on a Freddie Laker. Freddie Laker was one of the first uh, charter airlines uh, out of New York. New York, London, 99 bucks. Wow. And one of the things wow. was, you know, Whoa. it was a no frills, bring your own food, bring your own booze. Oh. People were smoking. I mean, oh. you just be on this charter <laughs> flight going oh. to Gatwick Airport, not Heathrow, uh, for $99. It was a 198 round trip. I remember having a return flight just in case things didn't work out. <laughs> but I uh, got to London. I uh, didn't really know where I was going to live. London, the, the whole apartment scene, or as they call it, flats, are very difficult to find. But, you know, I was thinking, it was like, you know, in my 20s, I knew I wanted to be an actor. My brother James Naughton was also a successful actor at this point in his life. He's a few years older than I am. And, he, you know, he was in New York, and, and I knew that that was going to be sort of my, my destiny, was go get some training, head to Broadway, be an actor on stage. And that was my sort of goal, was to do uh, theater. And... Uh, little did I know I was, you know, I was destined to become a pepper and, and what that was going to be like. And, you know, so I, I went to, to London, uh, to, to Lambda, and really one of, the, one of the things about it was being a student, you get to, I got this NUS card, which was this card called the National Union of Students. And this card was like a discount card for everything. Travel all over Europe if you wanted to, if you had the time. You know, things were discounted and theater tickets, discount, everything was discounted. Because we were broke, you know, there were a number of us Americans that had gone over there to study and it was cheap, 
you know, relatively cheap as far as the tuition goes, and then living, trying to find an apartment. Um, I remember answering an ad. There, they did rent sharing, which I never even heard of. You don't just get your apartment; you get a room in an apartment, you know, where you with total strangers. And the very first apartment I had was this really, you know, dive five flight walk up with an English guy and a Scottish guy and an Irish guy and me. And I could not understand the Scottish guy. And I would be sitting there talking to him. And you're going, are you speaking English? And I was so, uh, it was just such a wide eye opening experience to be an American studying acting in London uh, at this school. And one of the cool things about it was the theater was accessible to us. So everything in the West End I got to see cheaply, or we'd sneak in, or then, you know, by the second year we were getting jobs as ushers in the theater. One of my roommates had an, was an usher at the National Theater, so we'd, get, we'd sneak in and see everything that was in the repertory at the National Theater. Uh, I was working at the Royal Court Theater, which was a, uh, a kind of an avant-garde, new plays, new things that were coming, and got to watch actors act, and also got to meet them in the pub afterwards, and get to talk to actors being actors, you know, making a living as an actor, which was what our dream was as, as students. So it was really an eye-opening. Got to see Laurence Olivier on stage, John Gielgud, mm. Paul Schofield, uh, Alec Guinness. They were all in the West End at different times for different shows, and we got, got to see them. Got to see, I'll never forget, Trevor Howard. I don't know if you remember, he was an old British actor, drunk on his ass on stage, <laughs> you know, and literally tripping over the furniture, and we were all like, oh. And one of the people that we went to see in that production, I don't even remember what it was, was uh, a teacher at Lambda. And he was, in, he was so embarrassed that his students were in the, in the audience the night that Trevor showed up a little hammered. And, uh, you know, but it, as I said, it was, it was an opportunity to see Rocky Horror Picture Show debuted while I was there, you know, in London going, what is the show? And seeing Laurence Olivier at a party, at a rap party at the National Theater, where they used to do this play uh, in rep, like every third or fourth day they did this big Italian play where they had a feast. And the whole idea of the play was called Saturday, Sunday, Monday was the name of the play. And Saturday was the dinner, Sunday was the aftermath of the dinner that, you know, where they had the big family blow up. But they had to cater this dinner, so everybody that worked at the theater went, when's Saturday, Sunday, Monday? Because that, that was the day we'd all eat well. We'd sneak in and eat the food after the show the next day, and they'd just have this feast of ham and turkey and for all these starving students and people that worked there as ushers, and some of us that didn't even work there but got in. And uh, so that was the kind of, that was the fun part. Little did I know that five years later, it was about five years later, I, I returned to New York. I, I got, my first job was with the New York Shakespeare Festival, a production of Hamlet, the Sam Waterston that everyone knows uh, from Law and Order uh, was Hamlet. At both in Central Park and um, at Lincoln Center, a long production, full uncut, four hour version of Hamlet, if you can imagine, which I had all these small bit parts and costume changes. And what I learned from that production was how to play poker because we'd have a big poker game in the green room between these long scenes and listening to the play and playing, trying to learn how to play seven cards to. <laughs> uh, and you know, and meeting other actors and working in New York was my first job. It was like, wow, this is great. Little did I know what truly what being an actor in New York was like until the play ended over Christmas into January. It was over, and I didn't work again for the mm. entire year, like 1976 or so. And so I started. I found an agent, was going up for commercials, and doing off Broadway stuff. You know, no money, working hard, but being an actor and working, doing the craft and going to Broadway when I could, when I could afford it. And um, that was the life of, you know, an actor in the 70s in New York. It hasn't changed much, things, you know, the accommodations are always hard. You know, I think about the apartments, and the rents certainly have changed. You know, my rent, I had a rent rental, you know, $400 a month, you know, 400 bucks, hmm. where you think about what people and young actors now that are starting out, both here in Chicago, I'm sure, as, as well as New York and in LA, Rents are, you know, you don't live alone. You have to get a bunch of roommates and, and do that. Um, so I was, you know, working in New York, uh, trying to be an actor, uh, and going up for commercials. And I answered this ad for three, you know, three national spots for a soft drink called Dr. Pepper. Have you ever had one? I went, yeah, I think I have. Yeah, Dr. Pepper, yeah. 
I mean, it's the prune juice, you know, the kind of prune juice. No, there's no, there's no real anything in Dr. Pepper. <laughs> and, and I went up for these commercials, which were musical spots, and there was choreography involved, and I was not a dancer. You know, you're up in, in New York, you're up against real dancers, you know. These are the ones that do all the Broadway shows. They're fantastically trained. And uh, I was in there, you know, on an afternoon going, what am I doing here? <laughs> but for whatever reason, um, I was able to pick up the sort of easy steps uh, and remembering to hold the bottle the right way and and was having a good time doing it, which is something that they responded to. And, and that turned into a four-year contract uh, with Dr. Pepper that put me on the map as far as being in national commercials and people going, who is this guy? And, and the soft drinks, you know, was just taking off. It went to number three and after Coke and Pepsi. And, and it was hugely successful. And as I said, it brought me to the attention of people in LA where I would f find myself moving uh, very soon after. I, I didn't spend that many years in New York. I went to LA to do a series called Making It, which didn't. But <laughs> I was able to, uh, you know, talk my way into the recording studio to, to, to uh, try singing the title song for the show. It was based on Saturday Night Fever. It was a disco-themed idea, you know, growing up in New Jersey and going to the disco. And, and the song I, I recorded over the course of a Thanksgiving weekend in a studio with these guys whom I didn't know very well, but they were certainly up and coming. They, 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 were, they had just recorded Peaches and Herb, Shake Your Groove Thing, Reunited, uh, I Will Survive. These were hit songs that they had. And here I was, you know, in there going, I'm a pepper. I sang that jingle. And they went, well, let's see how you do with this. They had the four seasons we're going to sing the Making It theme song. And they had these scratch tracks that I had listened to. So I got a chance to try to record it. And they liked it and released it. And boom, it took off. Went to number five in the top 40. And I found myself going on American Bandstand, rocking New Year's Eve. And meanwhile, going, but I went to Lambda. You know, <laughs> I studied Shakespeare. And, you know, but I'm a pepper. What is that about? And it was really the, through those commercials, in terms of the exposure to those, that I was brought to the attention of John Landis, who was now very successful with his own office on Universal Lot, uh, who, you know, had done Animal House. He didn't know, but I had actually auditioned for Animal House and didn't get past the first, you know, pass when he was looking for guys. Uh, for, for his for Animal House, and then were you auditioning for any role specific, or uh, yeah, it was just a general audition, you know, to be one of the fraternity guys, any of those parts. And Tom Hulse, uh, Stephen first, you know, got these roles that were the leads, and and uh, but it was a chance to meet him, but it wasn't, it didn't go, you know, particularly well, or you know, very, you know, I wasn't too excited about it because I didn't hear anything after that. You see it when the movie's coming out, going, oh, I didn't get that one, yeah. Uh, and, and, and of course, shooting, animal, uh, shooting the Blues Brothers here and other places that were huge, hugely successful. So he had this script that he had written when he was 21, and I'm sure many people have heard the story. He was working as a production assistant on Kelly's Heroes, uh, a show that continues to air. I don't know if you've mm -hmm. seen this movie. People know it. It's a cool movie. A lot of famous guys doing a war picture. Mm -hmm. And John was a, a, a production assistant, which, as you know, or don't know, think of the bottom rung on, on any movies. You're basically uh, a, do, you know, a gopher uh, doing whatever needs to be done you know, and just excited to, to be there. Uh, and, but he had this opportunity to write at age 21 the screenplay, which is really the movie that we shot. I, I ended up <clears throat> being uh, introduced to him in LA when he was looking for people because Rick Baker and he were you know, had already decided on kind of how the makeup was going to be, um, but needed Rick needed the guys as soon as possible. So before John even had the movie financed, uh, he was casting the two roles of the guys, the boys as they call them, because Rick needed them in makeup as soon as possible. So I went in fairly prematurely. I thought it was like October 1980 at his at his. His office at the Universal Lot, and he was this young guy, and it was such an informal meeting, and we were laughing and joking, and he was uh, just—it was as informal as any audition I think I've ever had before or since. And based on that, he had seen my commercials. He knew, and has said subsequently that 
he liked the idea of this guy who was friendly and likable, even from the 30 or 60 second commercial, might be just the type of guy that he wanted personality-wise for his uh, one of his leads in his horror film. So the next day, uh, he said, call me, call me tomorrow and read this. He gave me the script, American Werewolf in London. Mm. And I, you know, I told him, oh yeah, I'd studied acting in London and I'd certainly been around the moors. I knew, I'd been on my bicycle uh, in Ireland on a trip, backpacking on a bike. He says, well, you won't be on a bike in this movie. Call me tomorrow. And I called him, he goes, you want to be a werewolf? All right, well, you need to get over to Rick Baker's shop. And soon that started the, the whole routine of going to Rick Baker's shop, which was, if you could see the way he ended his career, Rick retired like last year or the year before, you know, with a number of 100 employees in this, you know, huge building that he owned. Well, when I met him, he had rented like, you know, a garage space in a row of just rental places, like storage bins, with a bunch of college type guys as his assistants, learning how to do makeup. And when I went there uh, and found his address, and went in, he goes, which role are you playing? I go, I'm playing David. He goes, well, I feel sorry for you. <laughs> you know, wait, what, is that? what does that mean? <laughs> so uh, Rick and uh, started putting me through the, the motions of you know starting with my arms, to go easy, and these big vats of quick drying cement, alginate as they call it. And if you've ever had your teeth done, you know, and had those molds done of your teeth, it can be a little uncomfortable as it dries and you're trying to pry it off out of your mouth to make a mold or casting of your of your actual teeth. This is what he did on my head and I know my arms and on my legs, uh, you know, numerous times. I said, have you done this before? And they went, yeah, once. Yeah, he did it, he's okay. But the the, the, the head part is, is obviously the most claustrophobic. You don't breathe real well. And then they wrap it with gauze, just like a cast, so it's starting to dry on your head. And you're completely, you know, inside this tomb for 20 minutes or so. Um, until they pry it from the back and pry it off, and there's the you know the mold, the negative part of your of your facial mask. So uh, this was all done a couple of months before we actually went over to to England, where they had all set up with pre-production being done over there, and we shot obviously the entire movie in ten weeks there in London using the Twickenham Studios. Uh, Superman was being shot there with a real budget. And this little werewolf movie was being done uh, that, that John had financed through a company, you know, where he, the way he described it was, he didn't even have the money until after he delivered the film. But that also gives you total control. You know, no one's going to be telling you what, how it's gonna look or what. So he was cutting as he went along, uh, editing the movie as he went along, uh, casting as he did by going to theater and having people come. We, we barely got work permits you know, Rick and, and John and I and Griffin done, even getting work permits to shoot the movie there, even though it was gonna create all these jobs and an opportunity to shoot in London. There was, at British equity, it was very difficult mm. to, so they had to have auditions for the two roles. But, you know, little did they know that all the molds were already being made months before of our heads and faces. But sure, just to get us into the country, we had to have hold auditions for our parts and, um, no one was cast. No one beat us out of those roles. So we started the film. We started filming in February of, uh, of, of 1981, 40 years this year it will be released. And, and what's crazy is that uh, the very first day of shooting was the porn scene stuff. So there's, you know, these guys are all, you know, if, you, if you've ever met anybody on a crew, they don't get the scripts, they just get the gig. You know, they don't know what the movie's about. They know who the, the directors are, they may, recognize some of the names of the people in it, but they don't necessarily know what the content of the script is other than they hear it say it's gonna be it's two months, you know, it's work for two months, it's a horror film or something, hey, whatever, Twicken it, we'll make it. Job's a job. Yeah, it's a gig. Well, the first day, this crew shows up on, and we're shooting a porn scene and they go, what did we sign up for? <laughs> and many were, you know, on the verge of quitting until they go, no, no, this is just the movie that's playing in the movie theater. And, uh, you know, so they stuck, they stuck it out, and the, so to speak, and they hung in there for the, for the duration of the movie. And then, you know, I, we came along. And these guys were fun. A lot of them, a lot of experience on the crew, making fun of me every time I needed to streak in the woods. And, you know, and I'm looking at this, you know, the schedule, going, when are these scenes that I'm dreading, you know, which are anything to do with, you know, running 
transform any of the dream sequences? You know, when's the Jenny love scene? Let's look to yeah. that one. You know, <laughs> looking on the schedule, when is any of this stuff happening? Oh my God. And, you know, but fortunately for the, the film started out, uh, on day one for us was, uh, you know, just the way the movie starts. The truck driving up, we're in the truck in the back with the sheep. And that was our first day. And that was, those were our first minutes working together, Griffin and I, and, and getting a chance and doing those scenes out in the moors, walking along and talking about what we had planned. We started shooting in the beginning. Uh, and it wasn't to make us comfortable. It was really all because of the schedule was trying to give Rick Baker as much time as he could to finish all the makeup so that when it came time to shooting any of that stuff, and Griffin was getting made up sooner than I was, of course, uh, as his de you know, decay makeup was starting to happen. Uh, he was only in the film, and he talks about it, he was only in the film without makeup in the beginning. And, and then he, you know, every time you see him, he's grosser and grosser and more and more decayed, and that was just the way it was. But you know, the thing that I like to tell people about the movie is everything that you see in the film, we actually did. I mean, it wasn't, there wasn't any sort of uh, special effects to the, to the point where it, wasn't, it was done in post. For example, you know, you know, being in the wolf cage. Yeah, I was naked in a wolf cage with the wolves. Um, is it that, true that, that, like, the zoo was open for part of that film? Well, you know, there's a scene where where I come running across and I grab a jacket. You know, I've supposedly, I've wait, you know, I woke up in the zoo naked and now I'm trying to figure out how do I get back to the apartment. And, and so I run and I grab this red coat from a woman off a park bench and streak right across. Those scenes are all shot in the Regent's Park Zoo which we had to ourselves until they opened it. So I remember looking, going, now why would they have all these extras all the way in the back? You can really see them. He says, those aren't extras, the zoo's open. <laughs> you know, what, the zoo's what? <laughs> so, you know, the, and the scene, you know, coming up with the lady, I come out from behind the bush, and I look at her and say, like, excuse me. Well, they don't tell, that's an extra that woman who's working for the day on a show, who has no idea what she's doing, as far as what's going to be asked of her. And then she certainly haven't, been told that this naked guy is going to come out from behind a bush and say hello to her. And she was quite, a, you know, quite stoic throughout that whole thing. And that's the way we shot, you know. Um, the, the, the accident in Piccadilly Circus was one of those scenes that, you know, the crash happens in the course of one, you know, morning of daybreak, stealing the scene because they didn't have permission to shoot in Piccadilly Circus, to sh shut it down because it was such a you know, a, a, a important artery for London to work and drive around. So we just literally stole that scene. And then they go back and had a set where they had built for those inserts, all those little close-ups that you see that, to build the scene and to make it even longer. But it was one of those things that I couldn't believe was gonna happen because after they shot this scene and all these cars crash, you hear cut, and then all they just drive off. And they were all just stunt guys. And they just all disappeared, and Piccadilly was never really closed, any hmm. part of that little moment hmm. in time. Uh, and so, you know, there was all that stuff we continued to do. Uh, as I said, if you see it in the film, we shot it. It wasn't some sort of, you know, smoke and mirrors. And it was really uh, a very fast 10 weeks, you know, and the movie, we were finished in March, they were cutting the film. I was doing some posts back in LA, any sort of post-production stuff, I had to do a lot of growling one day. Come on in, we're gonna try some three-dimensional, 3D growling audio effects. And the movie came out in August, August 8th, August 21st. So from February to August, six months, is really a quick turnaround from start to finish. And it was released, as they said, in August of uh, 1981. And I brought my parents to the opening in New, in New York's Times Square, They're like, the Lowe's! Tonight opening with the things going, and, and my parents are going, now, is there anything you want to tell us about things? <laughs> I go, no, there's nothing I can really tell you about it, other than just what you're about to see is true. And they freaked out. I'll never forget how freaked out my parents were. And we're asked, and you know, uh, Roger Ebert was in the audience and wanted to interview my dad afterwards. My dad is catatonic. You know, so. <laughs> There's nothing to say, I was intervening. They have nothing to say, don't ask them anything. And that was it, and you know, the movie wasn't particularly, uh, it was sort of uh, uh, mixed reviews in the sense that critics didn't know how to review this film. 
Um, it was supposed to be, as John Landis definitely wanted it to be a, his horror film, and he made sure that the marketing campaign was from the director of Animal House, a different kind of animal. Meaning this is a horror film, folks. This is not comedy. Don't come in here yucking it up, thinking, even though there is a ton of, com you know, of comedy, and we do get along. You know, our, our little relationship, Griffin, Dunn's and mine, was funny and off the cuff. and <clears throat> Not a lot of improv either, by the way. All that was written by John. Uh, but the fact is it's on a lighter tone, and yet it really gets pretty gruesome. And, and you know, John's favorite thing to yell was, more blood, you know, as we went throughout the course of the film with all the different characters that uh, ended up being murdered. Yeah, I mean, I think the key to a good horror film is, is partly comedy, because if it's all intensity all the time, you're going to go insane. Well, yeah, it. and it wasn't you know, like we weren't setting it up. It wasn't a spoof, you know, where people right. try to, you know, cross that line, making it unbelievable. It was supposed to be very difficult to watch. And, you know, Rick's was, uh, we didn't really know what Rick was going to be like, other than as we got into his makeup, it was painstakingly slow, and he was a perfectionist. Um, one of the first nights that we were out on the moors and Griffin gets attacked, and killed, and I'm running away from the scene and turn around and come back and see Jack. Well, when Griffin gets attacked, you know, there's that moment where I go, hey, will you help me up? And then he, and then the wolf attacks him. Uh, how they were gonna stage that was Rick was really nervous because he only had two heads and they were only made like, you know, like puppet, not, you know, hand operated. And he only had two of them. So it wasn't like, you know, nothing could go wrong or we, we wouldn't be able to shoot that particular scene where Griffin gets attacked. And they weren't gonna rehearse it because, you know, <clears throat> you said, I'm gonna come at you, Griffin, but I want you to be really careful of the head and these teeth, which are plastic, but they're hard. I won't be biting you with them, according to Rick, but <laughs> just be sure these are, this is all paint. This is foam on, on the muzzle of the wolf. All this hair has been just, you know, stranded on and sprayed. It's a very delicate little prop, basically, and be quite careful with it. Okay, sure. Take one. Boom! They, <laughs> Rick attacks Griffin, who goes ape shit and practically rips the mask or the wolf head off off Rick's arm, and and Rick's literally wrestling with it and pissed off that Griffin's killing, you know. He's, he's completely mauling his. So they cut, they went, let's do take two. Well, Rick is beside himself going, my poor, you know, I've worked three months on this head. Fixes it up, but on take two, he went after Griffin as he tells the story. <laughs> so, well, this is called payback. And that's what you see in the movie, if you watch it. Rick, Griffin's really getting beat up by this puppet head that Rick is throwing at these right, right crosses. Trying to say, you're not gonna mess with my puppet head. And then, you know, there's scenes in the, when I'm in the floor, in the room after the transformation, and now it's the elongated part, that's taking forever. And I had no idea, believe me, even from sitting in the makeup chair, 10 hours a day, five days for that transformation scene, we shot the entire movie, wrapped everybody, and just had the transformation to shoot at the end. And that was sort of like, finally we're gonna get this piece of, you know, this was the biggest, uh, Question mark, really. This was going to be the payoff of the movie and or I've already shot everything there is to shoot, but I still have this one big hurdle to get over, which was this transformation. And, and it was as you know claustrophobic as anything I've ever experienced. And long periods of time in the floor, can't get out, you know, people are walking. It takes time between, sh you know, shots and people are always milling around. And, and uh, you know, then they start messing with you under the floor, you know, going, hey, it's awesome. You're like, Don't, I'll come out of this thing, you know. I'll, I'll rip this thing off, cut it out, come on, you know. So there was times for fun and levity, and the crew would always be giving us lots of jokes, particularly in any of the scenes that were outside, naked running scenes, going, ah, it's cold out, isn't it, Dave? It's very cold out. And so, but overall, we really had a lot of fun making the film. We had no idea how, what kind of reaction we were going to have, uh, what, what was going to be, you know, well, in 40 years, you'll be in Chicago on stage talking about the making of this film. But it did well for, you know, we all did well by it. I mean, Rick Baker certainly was acknowledged by the Motion Picture Academy, he won the first Academy Award for his makeup. And, you know, the first of seven, he's won seven Oscars. And this was his first. And the one that he talks about, uh, that people talk to him most about, even though he has all those other wonderful films 
that where he did effects and creatures. Uh, people seem to want to talk to him about American Werewolf. And John says the same thing, you know. Um, people talk to him about it because, you know, I, and what I've found over the years is that people, you know, wanted to go into film or wanted to become makeup artists or special effects artists or props. So many people started their careers based on, you know, this film. So this was one of the first horror films they'd ever seen and, and what impact that had not only in terms of scaring them but also wanting them to pursue a career. So, there you have it. <laughs> Should we try any questions or yeah, what do you think, Sarah? Anybody out there have comments? a question? Anybody have any comments or questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I find that werewolf films are amongst the hardest to get right, at least as a fan. Uh, but in 81, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you had American Werewolf in London, Wolfen, and The Howling all come out in 81. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people consider that amongst the top five, three of the top five werewolf films ever. Do you think there was a reason for that, or was it just kind of a trend that they got right at the same time? Well, I think you know there was the the uh, collaboration of artists, makeup artists. You know, Rob Botin and Rick were working on the Wolf and or, or the Howling. You know, before because John you know hadn't gotten the financing together for Werewolf. Rick was twiddling his thumbs, so he was starting to work on the howling. When and when John got wind of that, it was like, Rick, you need to get off that film right now. You know, come on, I'm getting ready to do my werewolf movie. So there was that. There was a competition involved as well. You know, of, of which film was going to come out first, as if to think that you know the first one out is going to be the most successful. And I, and and that's you know that's not necessarily true. Uh, who's going to race to go see the first werewolf film? But it is uh, a coincidence that they came out and have had, you know, the sort of uh, staying power that they've had. But I, I, I know that they were collaborating. You know, these new these effects, which were you know previously unheard of in terms of bladders, air bladders, and uh, were, you know, in the talk and and those films showed them. Uh, and, and you know, it's really amazing. I would go to Rick's shops in subsequent years and see the sort of stuff that they would come up with that you know you wouldn't even know. And they did commercials and things too where if they needed a baby, say a baby's arm, and you know a baby needed to pick up the product, well you can't always get a baby to do that, but you get Rick Baker to build an arm that goes down and picks up the product. Um, and on and on, They're really fascinating stuff. Things that move, you know, birds that fly or on a wire. <clears throat> All this mechanical stuff which was, and then he would paint, and he was such a good sculptor and such a fine painter, You've seen him, some of his stuff, his art is, uh, you know, is, is really top notch. And, and this is what he does now. You know, we, we had a chance to go to Spain last year over in uh, Tenerife, the Canary Islands, for a film festival. And Rick had his book. I don't know if you've seen his books. It's like a two volume piece of his work. And, he, you know, that's what he loves to do. He's not the most, uh, he, you know, he, he'd rather not go to the party. He'd rather be back in his room drawing, you know. And that's the kind of guy he was. And we didn't really get a chance to know him in the makeup chair other than, are we ready yet? No, it's going to be a while longer. <laughs> it's going to be a little while longer. And then once you get out on set, it's going to be a while <laughs> I mean, he'd just be right there with a paintbrush, you know, dabbing, dabbing away. And, and, you know, there's a scene where I'm in the forest and I wake up in the hospital bed. It's just weird. And I got these glass lenses on, which nobody wears anymore. These are solid glass lenses they put in with a, you know, a, a little suction cup put in there, and they're painted like wolf yellow. And mm -hmm. you're supposed to, you know, wear them 20 minutes, you know, get them out. Well, you know, what scene is shot in 20 minutes on a film set? And you know, like hour two, I'm going, can I get my things out of my eyes? No, we're almost ready. <laughs> you know, so it was, I always like to call it how torturous it was. Um, at the time, people were going, well, you know, in the elephant man, you know, he had to wear this mm. stuff all the time. So you just have to wear it. And Griffin would, you know, complain as well, going, how oh, come this is a role of a lifetime, and every time you see me, I'm more decayed. <laughs> and Rick's going, well, it's in the script. <laughs> and that's the way it is. So, <clears throat> and it, you know, I've, as an effect of that, I've, I've met makeup artists over the years at different kinds of things or shows. I certainly steered clear of wanting to do, hey, what other creature can I be turned into? <laughs> no, thanks. I've done it, had it done by the best. 
I don't need to be sitting there forever, uh, you know, in a makeup chair. Uh, but it's funny, the reaction that I get from makeup artists are going, wow, you're in my chair. Yes. <laughs> and I'm going to do some makeup on you. Yes. And I'm really nervous. <laughs> Why? You know, you're the makeup artist. I'm just sitting here, you know. And so it's been an interesting effect because they all know what it goes into making that stuff. And they're all so respectful of Rick and what he accomplished and has since accomplished in the career that he had. And, and he and John, you know, remain friends. John, on the other hand, when you go, and I've done a couple of panels where John and Rick are on the, uh, you know, for one thing, you don't get to talk because John generally is the chatterbox. But what he does do is makes fun of Rick, which is so funny going, because everybody respects Rick's work so much. But he's going like, Rick, come on, you remember? And because they worked on a movie called Schlock. I don't know if any of you ever heard of this. But this was like one of their first little high school things where Rick was using his mother's oven to make the creature faces and, you know, baking things. And they laugh about it. But, you know, that was their first sort of uh, work together, you know, and making little Super 8s and, and doing that kind of thing. But they stayed friendly and cashed it in with a big film like this one for them. And uh, it's, you know, as I said, then the, the, one of the things that I've been asked was like, well, you know, there's this talk about a sequel. You know, what about this idea of a sequel? I go, well, who wants to have a sequel done in a film that you're proud of going, you know, make, go make your own movie or come up with another idea. But then I thought of it in, in the sense that, you know, if they do a sequel, you know what will happen is they'll say, well, yeah, but did you see the original one? Which will just give legs, you know, another generation of kids and horror people will go, well, yeah, I saw it, but you got to see American Werewolf in London. Yeah, I mean, always look how many times Body Snatchers has been remade. Yeah, you look at... Or Phantom of the Opera or Dracula or any of those. There's always the origin piece. Yes. you got to go no, back to. No, it's true. You have to go back to it. And, and uh, so, 40 years this year. Yep, this is what 40 years looks like. 40 years later. <laughs> Anybody else? Has... But, yeah. Mm -hmm. What are the uh, top three weirdest scenes you see in the movie? In that movie or any movie? In that, American Horror from London. What were the, the weirdest movie yeah, scenes, the to the scenes to shoot? Well, the wolf scene, you know, clearly uh, the wolves was a challenge because we were in the zoo. It was towards the end of the day. We were losing light, which I was going, please get dark. We won't be able to shoot this. And, you know, their wolves aren't necessarily tame. Any wolves, even in captivity, they're not exactly trainable. So we had these three wolves, one of whom was supposedly in heat that I was told. <laughs> but we're going like, hey, this is not good. You know, this isn't the way I thought it was going to be. And they go, what's the story on the wolves? They went, well, they've been fed. <laughs> okay. So they've been fed. Great. Uh, no fast movement, no loud noises. Like, would we, somebody get them a script. I'm going to be tiptoeing out of here. You know, I wake up, see them. And, then, and so on action, we didn't really know. We sort of had them over there. Mm -mm. And we were going to see if they stayed where they were, you know, sort of positioned with their trainers, <laughs> who were girls, you know, young girls as trainers and going, thanks for that, guys. And I'm, I wake up and I see them. Well, as I start to move, they start coming over to me. You know, I'm going, mm. don't come over here. You know? <laughs> and I'm also supposed to get out of the cage, which I hadn't rehearsed. And it was a set. And I just tried to find my way out. And the thing starts to come apart. If you watch it, you see it start to come up. I went, I'm about to fall on my back, you know, right into the wolves. Uh, this is going to be not good. But I got out, one take, that was it. Thank you, I'm not going back in there. Well, we got it, we think. Well, I hope you did, hope you got it. That's one, um, you know, any of the uh, car stuff is always fun, you know, because you, you know, as you said, when you're, 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 you're shooting in the city, uh, you can't, you don't have control the, of everything that, you know, could happen or something ruin your take in the background that happens. So just riding around in the cab. Working with Jenny was a tr really a fun thing, Jenny Agater. It's so funny, I should just tell you, when I was a student, uh, acting student, we went to the National Theater and there was a play called Equus, which I don't know if anybody's ever seen it. It was, it was a terrific play about a boy who blinds horses. And the play is Equus. And the first, there's the men, there are, there are actors who are dressed, sort of dressed with these hooves, who play the horses and they're blinded uh, by this actor. And he has a scene where he meets the, the girl, the bar, the, the girl in the in the barn, and, and they have this sort of sex scene in the course of this play. And 
when I saw the play uh, at the National Theater in London, they had the set was such that in the back, the upstage part, they had rows of what looked like a jury, and audience members could sit on stage if you didn't have a program. And we used to play, you know, wait to see when we could get those tickets for those seats. So you're on, you're backstage, you're behind the curtain. The curtain goes up at the National Theater, you're on stage sitting there as an audience member. It's pretty, pretty cool. And so, but we're right there like ringside for this play. And in the course of the scene, they have this love scene where they're naked on stage. Turns out it was Jenny Hageter. And I, when I found out that it was Jenny who I had seen as a student, and we were now doing these other scenes, you know, as the nurse, I was like a fanboy. It was so embarrassing. <laughs> but she was a real trooper. She was, uh, you know, very professional. And, you know, the only girl on the show, and Rick. And you gotta be thick skinned around John Landis because He's the kind of director who makes fun, likes practical jokes. I mean, does everything that an actor, if, if you're insecure, you're not you know, gonna do well with a John Landis experience because he, uh, he has fun at your expense. And I, I was certainly uh, game for that, particularly in all the different you know, scenes that I was in, in Werewolf, where there was plenty of opportunity to make fun of everything. <laughs> But overall, as I said, it was uh, unexpected, the success of the film, the, 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 the reviews were mixed, but it tended to grow uh, as it was acknowledged as this particularly cool transformation scene. And as films go, um, you know, then CGI started to come involved, you know, and when that came in, it kind of pointed to those films, not to make them obsolete, but really to sort of show how those films really worked with, with just the, you know, using practical makeup and that how CGI needed to be rethought and used, I think, you know, very carefully because you've seen films that have been just like, yeah, we spent our whole budget on the CGI, which is post-production, which we sent, by the way, and nobody realizes the people that do the CGI have nothing to do with the film. They're not the director, they're not inspired by the writers or directors, they're just artists, so usually over in, you know, the Far East where it's cheap initially and doing their CGI, you know? and just told what to do, and, and the control aspect of it was, I think, um, hard to, to keep a hands on, and that's why so many of it, look at some of the films that you've seen, where you remember the Hulk, it was, I saw the Hulk with the CGI, and it's like, it's this bouncing little frog creature, you know, you're going, what happened, you know? And that's what happened in so many CGI, so that they got, I think, finally got, I don't know if they got it right, but at least they, they became aware that you could overuse it in a way that was not particularly, you know, beneficial to the film. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as I said, practical makeup is being brought back in many ways, too, or a mix of both. So, uh, and Rick, you know, he, I think he got tired of, he retired, we went, how would you retire? You know, you're still, you, you're at the top of your game, you know, you still are up on all the digital things, you can still do all the scrolling and things on a screen. He says, I was tired of people coming to tell me how to do it. Can you imagine? You're going in and telling the artist this is how it's supposed to look. And he, that's when he said, I'm out of here. So I haven't said it yet. Maybe I'm out of there and I don't even know it yet. He said, stay up. You know, you don't know when you retire as an actor, you kind of go, as long as you can still learn lines, it's always been the, the sort of the bar. You know, when actors can't learn stuff anymore, it's kind of like done. I remember I had the chance and opportunity, you mentioned Invasion of the Body Snatchers. I worked with Kevin McCarthy on a little movie, and he was, couldn't have been more fun. And he was about 85, 88, he lived into his 90s, he worked right to the end. Um, John Woodbine, who is plays the doctor in American World, I saw him in a movie about like two years ago, he's 90 something years old. I go, that's John Woodbine, I know it is. So, you know, there's nobody's, nobody tells you you're done until you say you're done, really. And that's in any career. You know, so I don't go until don't don't be forced out until you decide. Not until you're ready. Not until you're ready. That's it. All right, we got about five to ten more minutes. Is there any? Yeah. Like you said, uh, David, it's been forty years now. Um, was there obviously it's an iconic movie now, but started like so mixed reviews and that. Is, is there a like a point in time that you remember where something happened or whatnot that? kind of made you realize that, hey, this is, like you said, growing, or this has become bigger than I thought it would be. 
you know, like down the road, was there something that happened that kind of pointed? Not, that not necessarily a specific thing, just that you know appreciation, and then you know the shows, these, the, the the cons that have come, sort of developed over the years. You know, they started out. I mean. I remember the very first things that I recall were just Trek conventions, you know, Star Trek things, and if you weren't in, a, in the Trekkies, then there wasn't, you know, these sorts of conventions that I was aware of. But, uh, you know, it was getting to attend some of these uh, over the years, and I mean, you know, it's been 40 years, I haven't been going to shows for 40 years, but, but certainly to the point where you start to meet other filmmakers and get to meet people who have done similar things and appreciate the, the stuff so it kind of puts it in perspective uh, in terms of ranking it among the sort of films you know that people point to when you want to talk about transformation or you know music in a film you know I thought was another aspect of the movie that was really quite well used util utilized by Landis and you know the movie th he had all these all these moon referenced popular music that he wanted to put in one that he didn't get was you know Cat Stevens moon shadow he had approached, and Cat Stevens said, oh, no, no, you can't, you can't use my movie for a werewolf film. I went, okay. But, you know, Blue Moon and Bad Moon Rising, and, you know. And then, you know, I got, I, I got a chance, I was waiting to meet or see Van Morrison in, in concert, which, uh, living on Palm Springs is where I did it. He came to Palm Springs and performed, and he did uh, Moon Dance in this sort of up-tempo, Evening where he didn't even sing one one note, didn't sing one word of any song for the entire night. I'm going, Van Morrison, what happened to you? You know, because that was a major moment in my life, and I obviously I couldn't listen to Creedence Clearwater, you know, without thinking of that film, you know, and and you know, I think one helped the other as well. And I'm sure they've been asked, and I would have asked, although I was so disappointed with Van if I had had a chance to meet him, going. Did anybody talk to you about this movie, you know, and what it did for your for that song? But he was he was doing his all jazz set that night. <laughs> Crazy. So if there are any Van Morrison fans out there, sorry. Maybe I'll give him another chance <laughs> somewhere, sometime. Okay, well come on by the table if you feel so inclined. You can see some pictures of yesteryear. But I appreciate you coming on. Thanks so much. Thank we you. We appreciate you coming out. Thank you so much.